I am super excited today to introduce a dear friend of mine who has had a massive impact on my life and the life of my family. Her name is Pam Arland. She has a wealth of experience working as a linguist and translator and as a disciple maker and church planner. She lived and worked in Central Asia for 10 years and she planted churches among three people groups in this in very remote area there. And she now trains others to advance the Great Commission in the U.S. and abroad. Pam, welcome. Oh, dear. Well, thanks, Ken. I'm really happy to be here. And I'm happy we've had a long friendship. Yeah. I just really love you and your family and all that the Lord has done through you. So thank you. Tell us before we dive into this focus we have on what can uh, churches, church leaders, church members, ministry leaders in the U.S. learn from disciple-making movements around the world, tell us your story and how God worked in your life to give you this passion for disciple-making, a uh, passion for language, a passion for um, you know, training trainers and, and all of that. Tell us your story. Yeah, so when I was in college, I was in a, a college group that began to talk about the people groups on earth who never had a chance to hear about Jesus. And, you know, there's roughly 7,000 of them, give or take. And I thought, well, somebody should do something about that, right? Uh, but I would read these books about, you know, these amazing guys like Hudson Taylor. And I was like, well, I, I'm out. Like, I can never be Hudson Taylor. I can never be that awesome uh, but then I read a book by uh, a famous now missionary named Dr. Helen Rosevere, who went to Congo. And in her autobiography, she told the good, but she also told the bad and the ugly about her missions experience. And she demystified it for me. She made me realize that missionaries, disciple makers aren't superheroes. They're not just like, you know, wearing their little superhero cape. Uh, but that they're regular human beings who mess up and make mistakes. And God's graciousness is powerful enough to make an amazing difference anyway. And so I thought, well, maybe I could do this after all. Maybe I could be, you know, good enough, messed up enough that the Lord could use me as well. And then I moved to uh, Central Asia uh, to an extremely remote place, about as remote actually as where you lived and worked, um, not that far away really. And I had these, you know, what we often think of as poor people who can't read and write, who have no writing system for their language even. And, and by the way, it was highly persecuted, just like where you were working. So we never knew if we'd get a second visit with someone or not, uh, because, you know, you could get arrested. And of course, I've been arrested doing this. And so I was like, what's it going to take, Lord? What is it going to take for these people to be able to fall in love with you in the way that I've fallen in love with you? And he began me on a journey of saying, let's make it simple enough and concrete enough that everybody can participate. And by the way, you've got to do it fast because you may get arrested tomorrow and you may never get back. <laughs> and so you've got to pass on as much as you can in one visit. Um, and so, yeah, the Lord began to guide me into how, because I thought I was all sophisticated, right? I was in my 20s and I had a doctorate. And so I was like super smart. Uh, but he began to say, hey, sophistication is fine. It's not evil or it's wrong, but it's not actually necessary to follow him well, to be sophisticated. And so he began honestly to work on some of my hubris or my pride mm -hmm. to get me to recognize that simple things are powerful things. And then I just began to fall in love with them. And I began to fall in love with simple people, right? People who couldn't read and write. But when I saw, I feel like tearing up about it now. Mm -hmm. When I saw the Lord's loving kindness and power, common men and women, it transformed my heart. And I was like, I'm all in. I want to be a part of that forever and ever. That question that you asked is a very powerful question. What's it going to take? And you weren't asking, what's it going to take for me to get to just build a little church? You were asking, what's it going to take for me to reach these people, right? These people that don't know God and um, God, uh, that's a, that's a powerful question that I think if we start 
truly asking that uh, no matter where God has us, um, it's going to, it's going to shake up some things, maybe a little bit more than we're comfortable with. And, and just like you, it's going to deal with our hubris. It's going to deal with our pride. Um, and, and so, so you were blessed to, to see uh, disciples being made. And did any of those disciples make disciples? Yeah. So, you know, basically to, you know, zoom past uh, a long story. So, you know, fast forward through seven years of learning three different languages, which thankfully we don't have to do when we're in our own home culture, Mm -hmm. we already speak those languages. Um, I basically just began to follow the Luke 10 model and I would literally just go out to villages and just be like, hi, I'm here. Who wants to talk to me? Who's willing to be nice to me? Who's willing to invite me into their home? And because I spoke the language, uh, I did often get invited in. And And that is in your training, we find out that is basically God revealing to you who the people of peace are, right? Um, the, the people that he's working on typically. Yeah, so we're, uh, Luke 10 2 talks about finding the persons of peace and we're not trying to activate people for the gospel. We're trying to find people that Holy Spirit has already activated. Mm-hmm. And so we're on this kind of divine treasure hunt to see where he's been working. And that's actually kind of fun to be like seeking out where's God been working here. And I know he's been up to something. I just need to find out what he's been up to. And, you know, he said right there that the harvest is plentiful. It's the workers that are few. And I am completely convinced that every place on earth has a ripe harvest. We just haven't sent enough workers into that harvest. And so I would stand in the middle of a village and people would greet me. And then I would follow if they would invite me in, I would follow Luke 10 which says, eat whatever's put before you, which you know as well as I do, sometimes that's the hard part. Um, <laughs> heal the sick. And I don't think I have a gift of healing. So that's kind of a, you know, an intimidating and scary thing for me to hear the Lord say, heal the sick, and then tell them that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so we did that. And I could tell some specific stories of that if you want me to. Um, but telling people that the kingdom of God was at hand meant telling a story from the Bible, without opening my Bible, telling it from memory, drawing stick figures while I was doing it, making them draw stick figures, and then telling, and then asking them, hey, you want to follow Jesus? When they didn't know a lot, there was a lot that they didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. But if they were sensing the love of the Holy Spirit, if they were sensing the love of Jesus towards them, calling them in, knocking on their door, to use Mm -hmm. biblical terminology, I didn't want to say, sorry, there's, there's still too much. You don't know. You're too dumb. You can't come in yet. Right. 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 So after one story, if they sensed the goodness of the Lord, I was basically like, come on in because Jesus is knocking on your door. You open that door. Let's start this journey together. Yeah. That's right. And I'm not asking them to, you know, finish their seminary degree or something. Mm -hmm. I'm only asking them to start a journey. Yeah. He's giving the invitation and I'm just saying, it's okay to open that door. Let's go on this right. journey together. And, and the way you're doing that too, uh, you know, when you're sharing that story and you're having them basically practice sharing the story. Sometimes uh, I know in my experience, I've seen, I've had people who haven't yet made any kind of decision to follow Jesus. They're excited about those stories. And I've seen, uh, I call them pre-leavers <laughs> because you can tell God's working on them, but they haven't committed yet. But I've seen them going and making disciples <laughs> before they even have officially become a disciple yet because it's it's been made so accessible to them. And uh, it's something that they get excited about. Give us one story of how you just showed up in a village and um, you were tired and worn out and not in a good mood but you saw God work anyway after a long bike ride, I think. Yeah. Almost all of our stories are after a long bike ride at (laughs) 14,000 feet in altitude. Right. Um, And that's another thing. Like I had never really ridden a bicycle much before, but when I was asking the Lord, what's it going to take? 
He said, it's going to take learning to ride a bicycle. So you never know, right, what he's going to ask you to do or how he's going to ask you to grow. So um, we, we rode out to this village and we stood outside and waited for people to come out and greet us. And this lady came out and we did the greetings back and forth. And she said, well, you can talk. And I was like, yeah, we can talk, which means I could speak her language, right? So she invited me into her home because she thought, you're weird. How is it that you're like a foreigner who can speak my language? I'm so interested in what you might have to say, right? So we went in and we ate her food, right? Luke 10, here we are back at that Luke 10, eat whatever's put before you. And her food was not good. But anyway, we ate her food. And uh, then I said, are you sick? Can we pray for you? And she said that her knees hurt. So I said, all right, well, we'll pray for your knees. And so I just said, basically, knees be healed in the name of Jesus, because I couldn't do a fancy prayer in my fourth language. Right. And I don't think prayers have to be fancy to work. Uh, so then I said, well, like, how do your knees feel? And she said, well, the same. I said, oh, so I said, hey, you guys were with me. Why don't one of you guys pray for her? And they prayed for her and they prayed a fancy prayer, which I was supposed to translate, but like I couldn't <laughs> translate it really very well. So it came out roughly the same in her language. Um, and we finished in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we said, how do your knees feel? And she said, oh, they're the same. I was like, oh, well, I said, could we try again? Um, I, you know, there's that perseverance showing. Yeah. And three is a biblical number too, right? It's a biblical number. It's not really like three strikes and you're out, like, you know, but right. anyway, I thought I'd try again. Um, so I prayed for her knees again. And then I asked her, like, how do your knees feel? And she used this grammatical construction that means totally, completely, 100% the same. <laughs> like, if she wasn't going to give me an ounce of progress, right? And inside, I immediately, like, lost all my sanctification, right? Like, I was mad. I was mad at God. I was like, God, you didn't notice. Like I spent multiple years learning languages. I drug this bicycle for the past five hours over these horrible rocks at 14,000 feet in altitude. I'm really sunburned. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. That was your part. Jesus, this is the part where you show up and you're really awesome. You heal people. I can't heal people. You kind of missed your cue. This is where <laughs> you're supposed to show up. Uh, and I, I was embarrassed, right? When you pray for people like that and they don't get healed, you just feel like embarrassed. And I felt all yucky inside and I, I wanted to just like, but, my but you were doing that because that's the model that Jesus gave his disciples. Right. And so you're just practicing simple obedience. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go and that's part of it. Yeah. And so I told her, I said, look, sometimes when I pray for people, they get healed and sometimes they don't. And like, if I knew the difference, I would fix it so that a hundred percent of people got healed. <laughs> And I said, but I don't know, but it's sometimes if you pray in the name of Jesus, people get healed. So I said, hey, uh, can I tell you a story about Jesus, right? Step three, tell them that the kingdom of God is at hand. I totally wanted to leave, but I had committed myself to loving and obeying Jesus. And Jesus said there was a three-step process, so I wasn't going to bail after step two, even though I wanted to. I mean, I really, really wanted to, right? Um, so I said, hey, can I tell you a story about Jesus? And she said, sure. Um, maybe she's just being polite. She probably is just being polite. So I got out my paper, started drawing my little stick figures. I think I was telling the story of Zacchaeus that day because it's often my lead story that I tell. Um, and then I said, would you like to follow Jesus? And she said, yes. And I figured she didn't really mean it because people are just polite in those cultures, right? <laughs> I figure she's just being polite, but I was like, all right, well, you know what? Jesus people tell Jesus stories. That's what Jesus people do. And I moved us on to the commit to pray and obey part of disciple making movements. And so we practiced the story until she could tell it herself. This was on a first meeting, right? And then I made her pick out the names of three ladies and pray for them by name. And I taught her how to pray for opportunity to share the gospel. And then I said, okay, we got to go. We have to leave. And Had a long I bike left. ride back, right? The long bike ride back, which she said, hey, if you go that way, it'll take you 20 minutes instead of the five hours you just spent getting here. <laughs> <laughs> and it was true. Uh, we had been totally lost. All right. So I went back to the university where I was teaching and um, I was mad at God pretty much like all winter long waiting to see her again. But when I went back to find her the next summer, she came running out of her house 
with a cat in her arms and she dumped this cat in my arms and said, gift. All right, so I've, I've always been a dog person. Like recently <laughs> two cats adopted us. So we're okay with that. But you know, cats aren't my first preference. Uh, but I was like, wow, a cat, thank you. Why did you give me a cat? And she said, because I went to one of those three ladies that we prayed for and I took my little stick figure papers and I went over and I told her that story and I made her draw the story. And then she said, and I don't know what's wrong with you, but when I prayed for her for healing, she got healed right away. And that <laughs> just worked for all of us. When we prayed saying in the name of Jesus, everybody's gotten healed. And I made everybody draw stick figures. I made everybody pray for three people by name and they each went and repeated exactly what I had done with them. But I want to be clear that I had done that probably hundreds of times before. And when people said, sure, I want to follow Jesus, they did nothing afterwards. And so I don't want people to think, wow, you just do this once and this happens, right? right. Um, no, I mean, I had done it hundreds of times, gone back to check up and they'd done nothing. Mm -hmm. But see, what happens is when you really find the super fruitful soil, the 30, 60, 100 fold soil, then it just goes boom. It, it just expands through a population, but it took me hundreds of times of hitting my head against the yeah. same wall. So if over people, over if, again. if people are a lot, you know, say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to step out in faith and try to find a person of peace and make disciples. And they go and they, they think they found someone they try and it doesn't work. That doesn't mean they should stop. Right. <laughs> that, right. It, it doesn't mean they should stop. And in fact, right in Luke 10, Twice, Jesus talks about rejection, it, that it's going to be a normal part of the process. And he actually says, when people reject you, don't worry about it. It just means that they rejected me. And he says, just shake the dust and move on. Yeah. And so, yeah, we have to do this widespread seed sowing, which I think is one of the things that's hard to do, right? Like, who wants to be rejected? Nobody wants to be rejected. Who has enough time in the West right. to do widespread seed sowing? But yeah, that's what yeah. it takes. And that I like that story, too, because it will give everyone listening uh, a, a, a picture, just a portion of the of a picture, but a, a pretty good picture of what we're talking about when we're talking about going out and making disciples. Now, you are going to a place where you were completely unknown and a different culture. And so it's different here. Obviously, people have a chance to be the person of peace in their neighborhood. Uh, not just look for people of peace because it's where they live and it's their home culture and all of that. But that, that simplicity, I, I like that story because it gives the, those watching or listening just a picture of, of the simplicity that, that uh, we're talking about when we just follow a, a simple model. Um, and it, it kind of leads to one of the main parts that, that we're talking about, but one of, one of them, um, the last one actually in the list of seven, and these are areas that may be barriers in our culture and really probably in any culture, but definitely barriers in our culture to seeing disciple making movements happen. And that seventh one was perseverance and, and sacrifice. Um, and, in that, I, I just wrote, disciple making is not glamorous. It is challenging on a gut-wrenching le level and perseverance is key. And I was going to save that for the end of our time together, Pam, but th that story leads into it so much, so well, and we've already touched on it. Um, talk about that. Uh, you know, people in America like to stick things in a microwave. Uh, they like set it and forget it solutions. But that's not how it works in disciple making, is it? No, it's it's not how it works in the kingdom, right? So it's not how right. it works in disciple making. You know, most people, when you read these amazing and and they're true God stories and the different books that I saw on the website, those are many, many books that I've read. They're great stories. But what the books sometimes don't tell you is that there's a backstory often. And the backstory that gets skipped over, like I just said, seven years of language learning, boom, there it went, you missed it. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times you hear almost always that there was a complete failure, false start. Um, and that has certainly the case, for example, um, in all nations, we have a, 
our largest church planting movement is the one in Uganda. And it's led by a Ugandan man uh, named Wilson. And when he had a little bit of disciple making training, he went back to Uganda and he tried to do it. And he fell completely flat on his face the first time. I mean, the entire thing imploded uh, on him. And he what realized- does, what, the, what, does, what does falling fat, flat on his face look like? So his disciples either never made any other disciples or they just flat out eventually rejected Christ and turned away. Mm -hmm. uh, so either they left- Christianity altogether, or they never became disciples who made disciples. And he could have given up. I mean, he could have been like, you know, I tried that thing. It didn't really work. But what he realized is that he had tried it, but he hadn't actually tried it completely. He hadn't quite turned his old paradigm from the way he had been thinking before. And so he hadn't really quite done what he had been taught the first time. He, he was wanting to add this new thing onto the baggage he was already carrying, I guess. Huh? That's right. And the, the hybrid version of it uh, wasn't actually healthy for anybody at that point, the way he had set it up anyway. we It can be both and, right? But mm -hmm. the way he had set it up, it just wasn't working. And you'll hear this over and over and over again, that we were at it for five or six years. We were at it for six or seven years before it finally turned a corner. And we finally found those few people who were the super spreaders. We finally found within our local cultural context, how training would work well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of false starts, um, and, but that's okay. We just pick up and we yeah. try it again. And often when we hear people share stories of movements you know when you read miraculous movements and and they will include some of the hardships and challenges and sacrifice but you you typically mostly hear about the victories right because that's the, those are the stories that are heartwarming they're the ones you want to share they're exciting. You know, it'll help motivate others to want to do it. Jesus was uh, almost brutally clear <laughs> with, you know, I think you you were talking about Luke 10. You back up to Luke 9, at the beginning of Luke 9, where he sends out the 12. Luke 10, he sends out the 70. Several times in that chapter, he talks, he, he, he makes it clear that there's going to be a cost to discipleship, which includes disciple making, right? Yeah, that's right. And it means, honestly, a complete readjustment for most of us on how we live. And those of us who've been doing it for a while, I find I fall back into old ways and I have to do course recorrections from time to time. So it means, of course, I'm still involved in a local church and I have fellowship with believers, uh, but I have to be careful to make enough time in my life for non-Christians. I can't just spend all of my life with believers. It also means, you know, you and I are in full-time ministry, but for those who have, who have the blessing of having these jobs, like being an engineer, a doctor, a janitor, a farmer, whatever they are, of saying, when was the last time I even prayed for the people in my workplace? When was the last time I actually, when they said, what did you do this weekend? I said, hey, yesterday at church, this is what I learned. And that's not actually just, you know, doing an evangelistic presentation. It's being honest about you. Yeah. yeah. And that's dangerous for you because you might get rejected. <laughs> right. Right. And and there may in 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 this day and age and in, in our culture here in the US, um, stepping out in faith and going beyond praying and actually, sh you know, sharing with someone in your workplace uh, that could bring some risk or uh, potential persecution on some level as well. I mean, we're, we're in a day and age where it's that, that can be a, a challenging thing to face uh, in our culture, but it's something we've been called to face. And, you know, we don't want to just go into our workplaces and be dumb. We don't want to just right. turn into the, all I ever do is talk about Jesus. Uh, but there are, if I could say it this way without sounding trite, there are whimsical ways, lighthearted ways, natural ways, actually, to talk about Jesus other than just a straight up, you know, textbook evangelistic presentation. You know, sometimes I use the analogy of the um, Olympic relay races, and I don't know if you've talked about that here. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But in the Olympic relay races, the American team usually fails. And the reason they fail is because they drop the baton in those events where you pass a baton from one person to another. And the reason they do that is because they put together the four fastest runners. We normally only run the last leg of that race. And the last leg of that race, people receive the baton, right? But they never pass it on. And right. so what we've done in, in most of Christianity, not even just American Christianity, all right, but pretty much globally, is we've been good receivers, but passing on the baton is a different skill set. And if we mm -hmm. don't practice it, if we don't teach it, people will not be able to do it. Why should we expect them to be able to do it? But it's also not a complicated thing. Too often we make it complicated or don't teach it at all. You said a word that can mean a lot of different things, but this idea of practice, how do you practice disciple making other than just trying doing it? Is there, are there some things you can practice even ahead of time? Yeah, absolutely. The basics to practice ahead of time are the stories from the Bible and be able to have them come out of your mouth in a way that's natural. You don't have to have them exactly word for word, make sure they're accurate. You know, don't just make up stuff or just add stuff that's not there, but tell it in a way in your own words, but in an accurate way and make sure you practice that. Uh, a great way to do that is to have a storytelling buddy to get together once a week with somebody and practice those stories back and forth. You don't even have to get together. I've known people, you know, during these lockdowns that are just doing it through their, through Zoom or through even just messaging apps, sending a video of themselves, telling the story, tell it to the mirror that you're looking at in the morning. So you can practice those things. And then the other good thing, you know, we talk about how in movements, the best way to learn is not sitting in a classroom but it's to come alongside someone who's an older brother or sister in the faith, a mentor, a disciple, a coach. We often call them a coach. Um, and they say, come with me as I do this. I've done this before. I know how to do this. You don't even have to do anything except come with me. You know, don't worry. I'm not even going to make you talk this first time. Okay. Like the next time I might, uh, but this right. first time just come with me and you'll see it's not horrible. It's not scary. It's not hard. Um, so spending a lot of time showing people how to do things, and then we use the acronym SAVE, right? Then right. assisting as you do it, view, watching them do it, and then exit. They can do it on their own. So SAVE, show, assist, view, exit. Yeah. And I think uh, instead of the full acronym SAVE, most, uh, and I know there's a lot of ministry leaders and a lot of church leaders that are part of the discipleship.org collective and um a lot of times we just are we're snakes we're just going we're just showing right and we're not doing the full save acronym which is show and then you assist them you're still kind of part of leading it but then you just view it and afterwards uh you can talk to them about, you know, how it went or whatever. But then the big, the big thing that we really struggle with is trusting the Holy Spirit enough to do um, the exit and, and let them uh, equip and power and then release them into uh, doing it themselves. But that's so powerful that that modeling the best way to become a disciple maker is to go and hang out with someone who makes disciples, right? And experiencing that with them. And I think uh, one of the powerful experiences, if, if, if there is a, a short-term trip that can connect you and let you see a disciple making movement, it can be very powerful because you should simply walk around and you see them doing that and of course that's in a safe place for you because you're out of your culture and that kind of thing but um but to to walk with a disciple maker and and experience it which is what jesus did right they were walking around with him and then at some point way before we would have thought they would be qualified or prepared he sent them out <laughs> and to to do what he'd been doing right and he sent them out and they sometimes failed quite miserably 
after he sent them out, right? Sometimes they just, uh, in their own hearts, even got broken in their deep, deep failures. And so Jesus is willing to take a chance on immature disciples. Mm -hmm. And he is so gracious that when we make honest mistakes, I think he's like, okay, I will help you fix this thing that you just (laughs) messed up. Um, very rarely have I seen, you know, young leaders or baby believers make mistakes that are just life ending, um, or movement ending. Typically they're just, oh yeah, I messed that up. And you're like, that's okay. You learned. And your heart is towards him. Your heart is still soft. So that that's, that's okay. Um, the ones we need to worry about are the ones who are not living in obedience and their hearts are hard. Right. People who make right, honest right. mistakes with a soft heart, man, that's actually just beautiful. That's just growing yeah. in the Lord. <laughs> Finish your story about Wilson. So he, he, um, he fell flat on his face. He, he struggled, but uh, that, that didn't stop him. Right. That's right. So Wilson um, was hungry for something different to happen in his environment. And he knew where the hungriest people were, so to speak, for the gospel, and it was the ghettos. And that's what they call it in Kampala, so not using a derogatory term, but it was where the poor people are. And he is a man with a master's degree who worked at a bank, all right? So this is not actually a normal environment. That's not, that's not his comfort zone, right? That is, no, that is not his comfort zone at all. Um, and he would go into the ghetto, and he would... Uh, he would do discovery Bible study where he would share the stories of Jesus with people who sometimes were actually still drunk or still high. And he thought, oh, this is probably never going to work, but he's going to do the process. And most of his core leadership team now, he basically has about 11 or 12 people that are his core leadership team. Almost all of them came from the poorest of the poor backgrounds, um, have almost no education, were probably addicted to drugs Um, And their hearts are so on fire because they know the transformation of Jesus in their lives. And because the tools are simple enough, they've been able to take those tools to the next people and the next people to where they have, last I heard, they have planted over 3,000 churches um, entirely by Africans planting those churches. Many of them are are prostitutes, actually ex-prostitutes now, that's the way that Mm -hmm. works. Um, Right. (laughs) All sorts of different backgrounds. Uh, But they've even gone into other countries that I I are so high security, I can't mention them here on this call because I'm I'm not sure where it's gonna go. But in one of the most closed countries on earth, uh, they were able to disciple people just through um, an app that's like, WhatsApp or Signal, we use Signal, Mm -hmm. and you can send voicemails and text messages. And they disciple people entirely through this app. And we're able to lead about 90 Muslims to the Lord uh, by discipling Africans through this app using simple methods. And when you say 3,000, I I know, uh, I want to make sure everyone knows, that doesn't mean Wilson planted 3,000 churches, right? There's generations that have multiplied. That's right. And I honestly don't know how many generations they must be out to by now. I haven't seen their latest maps, Uh, but certainly different branches for up to 15 generations. But I should also specify that these churches are small, right? I mean, I think you've already uh, talked to Justin Long. Um, You know that Mm -hmm. the average size of these kinds of churches is about 17 people. And so I don't want people to get a false impression that each one of these are like a thousand people or 5,000 people or even 150 people. Um, Some of them are bigger, but like big ones, you know, would maybe be in the thirties. Almost none of them have paid professional staff. Almost all of them are continuing in the jobs that they had before. And almost none of them have a dedicated building where they meet. They're meeting in somebody's home or they're put up a tarp sometimes and just meet in a courtyard because uh, Uganda's got a pretty nice environment. So that's good for that. I think it's usually good to have some sort of shelter in most places in North America. Right. <laughs> when you do I, remember, I remember hearing a story from our mutual friend, who's the international director of All Nations, when she was walking around with Wilson and, and she said it was just surreal because they would take a few steps and he'd look up at some storefront and say, well, there's a church in there. And then they'd go a little farther and he'd just point over to a house and 
there's a church in there and and there were so many it's so saturated that area of the slums that they didn't even really uh worry about crime there anymore and and that it was very transformative for that area yeah that's right where there were believers now in the slums um it was a completely different environment and actually uh, the same thing had happened in our church planting movement that's in Zimbabwe. Um, that one is led by actually a golf professional. Um, that's his job. He's a golf professional. He actually teaches other people mostly to do golf. Um, but uh, the policemen came to him and they said, yeah, we're bored now. Ever since, you know, the gospel took over here, we have nothing to do. And I was like, bored policemen is good. I like yeah. that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I know that because of your passion for uh, seeing multiplying movements, that leads you primarily uh, in your training to talk about uh, simple churches that are small and can multiply easily. But where you live, you're not there now because you're traveling around doing training. You're in Alabama now, right? But you live in the Kansas City area and you are a part of a very large church. Uh, I would say a mega church. It's got escalators. I think that makes it qualify as a mega church. So how do you reconcile those two? Is that okay to be passionate about simple church and disciple making movements and be passionate about uh, larger congregational churches as well? Well, obviously I don't see a contradiction here or I wouldn't do both of them. I think that there are lots of different methods that are needed in the kingdom of God and there's no one correct method. But what I know is when I look at that church that I go to that I love, it's, it's actually a really good church, right? Um, but I walk by literally four other churches based in buildings on my way there. It's only a mile from my home. So I walk to church typically. Um, but I know, and what's really cool is that church knows that that model will not reach everybody in our city and it won't reach everybody in the world. And so while they say our model is good for a lot of people, it's not the right model for everybody. And so that church itself is comfortable operating with multiple modalities, if you want to use a more technical mm -hmm. sounding term, or different ways of doing life. Um, right. So, you know, if we're reaching Somalis in our city, then we're probably going to need to have a different kind of church for the Somalis. Uh, if we're reaching even maybe poorer people in our city in different parts of the city, although we're not from a wealthy part anyway, we're going to need different models. And one of the things that I love about the pastor of that church is he used to say, if you bring your friends to church here on Sunday morning because you need me to lead them to Christ, then what you're saying is you are a bad pastor and you have not done your job. He said, because <laughs> my job is to equip the saints for works of service, Ephesians 4. And he's like, it's my job to teach you how to lead your friends to the Lord. And if you come here and tell me to do that, then I have failed in my job. And he would declare that from the pulpit over and over again. He said, of course, I want you to bring your friends here. He said, but I also want you to have friends that are so unusual, different from us, that you recognize that this way of having church is not the best way for them. And wow. when you realize that, we're going to work with you to help you to start a new church, not because there's anything wrong with this church, but because everything is right with this church. And so that's what I think that it's a really healthy approach to having multiple models. So basically uh, church leaders, they don't need to be afraid of people in their congregations who maybe are getting excited about disciple making or even disciple making movements, right? That's a, it's a good thing to have people in your church excited about that. Yeah, it's good to be excited. And the, as far as I know, the few churches in North America that have really embraced this, not only have they ended up planting more churches in their pockets around their own city, but their original building based church also grew and experienced numerical growth because some of the people that their congregants led to the Lord were like, no, I like that thing, that big building thing you go to on Sunday mornings. I want to be a part of that. And you're like, well, that's great. That's yeah. an available option. But if that's not, not you, we have others. And, it, and if you're a part of it, that doesn't mean that's the only thing you can be doing. I mean, you can, you can enjoy that celebration on Sundays and you can still be making disciples and maybe even planting churches right uh, along the way. 
Yeah, because you're not planting a church because you're a cranky Christian or you think there's yeah. something wrong with your church. You're planting another church because your church loves the expansion of the kingdom and releases you to do that. So you're not saying, oh, don't go there. That's no good. You're like, I love that place, but that may not be the best place for you. Let's figure out the best place for you. If it's there, we we'll go there because I go there. So come on. But if not, we'll start another place. <laughs> I want to close with one, one thing that was really powerful that you shared, and I've used it a lot, and I probably haven't given you credit every time I've used it, but it was not long after the COVID shutdown. We really haven't addressed COVID much, but, um, and everyone was talking about social distancing. Suddenly, the entire world knew this phrase, social distancing, and you, you had a unique take on that with regards to the church. Do you remember that? Yes, because, you know, we've been talking about a viral like spread of the gospel, like for as long as I can remember. And people just gave me these blank expressions. Uh, but now they're like, oh, I get it when there's a viral like spread of anything. Uh, but we as believers have basically practiced too much social distancing. We have basically said, oh, I'm not going to hang out with non-Christians. I'm not going to spend my time with non-Christians. And therefore, we haven't seen a viral like spread of the gospel. And so in this case, social distancing is unhealthy. We need to right. actually unsocial distance as believers. And we, you know, I'm not saying that we need to take on their bad habits or take on their ungodly ways of life. Uh, quite the contrary. Um, I'm hoping that they will move towards Christ. But, you know, one of uh, my old mentors used to say that if you're going to share the gospel, sometimes you have to sit in the smoking section of the restaurant. <laughs> and I don't like it when people smoke around me. I don't like cigarette smoke. But, hey, if that's where there are people who need to hear about Jesus, then I'm going to be in that place. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's why Jesus told us to go two by two so that when we go into unhealthy environments, we have another believer with us who keeps us strong in him mm -hmm. and in his mighty power and keeps us maybe even from falling. Uh, but yeah, we have to get really close and be good friends yeah. with people who don't yet know Jesus. Yeah, that's great. And I know in, in your training, you're, you know, you were, you really convicted me in, in realizing, hey, if, if I'm trying to reach out and I'm just running up against the wall, um, maybe I need to look for a different segment of society that might be a little bit more hungry. And often those are ones that are a little more downtrodden, maybe more impoverished, uh, or maybe it's the proverbial other side of the tracks of people that I might not feel that comfortable around. Um, but that's our, that's our Samaria, right? We're to be witnesses in uh, Judea, Samaria, um, to the ends of the earth and, and um, that the, the people that we might not be comfortable around, the ones we've socially distanced ourselves from, those may be the very people who are, God's preparing and the people of peace who are ready to respond. Well, Pam, uh, I, I really love talking to you. We could talk much longer than we have time for for this um, for this webinar, uh, but uh, I really appreciate the time you've given us because I know that there are a lot of uh, a lot of demands on, on you with all the opportunities God presents uh, to you, and you have to prioritize. So thanks for giving us some of your time. Oh, thank you. I love any disciple who wants to be a disciple maker. That's going to pop up to the top of my list. Thank you. Yeah. And just a reminder, if you are interested in just checking this out, it, it's very small, but very powerful. Uh, it's a guide to church planting, but, uh, you know, obviously that has a, a lot to do with disciple making, which are, it's all kind of the same thing. On the website, there's another uh, pocket guide that uh, another mutual friend who Pam uh mentored and it's a pocket guide to coaching disciple makers which is really really a, a neat resource as well check that out a lot of other resources and any um 
any church leader who might be interested in uh, any of the trainings that they offer, I, I would uh, strongly encourage you to check them out because uh, every, every training I've been a part of that All Nations puts on, whether it's Pam or some of the other trainers, they uh, it's very, very powerful. And, and so I want you to Check that out. Thanks again, Pam. We love you. And and uh, when I say we, I'm thinking of my family. My family loves you dearly and, um, and wish we could be with you more. But that's why we have eternity, right? We get to, we're not losing any time together. So. Amen. That's right. Thank you, brother. All right. God bless.